Databases are a big deal, particularly in the cloud. Uh, as you're building your company, your uh, database is probably going to be the center of your life. And we're talking to an expert from Aerospike today who is making an in-memory database. What the heck is that? We're going to talk about that right now. And who are you? My name is Brian Bulkowski. I'm the CTO of Aerospike. We are a scalable in-memory database company. I've been working in, on this project for about five years, but I've been doing software all my life. My first project while I was in high school was based on teaching and using pen and uh, light-based computer to allow uh, teachers to very quickly in art history systems uh, lessons be able to uh, write and uh, change what they're doing on a, in a classroom environment. And this was on IBM PCs in, uh, let's see, I guess about 1983. Since then, after college, came out Silicon Valley. That's the great place to get a education in databases. Worked in networking primarily, a company that was acquired by Novell. I've never joined a company of greater than 30 people, but always uh, ended up working for larger companies eventually. Yep. Um, so your uh, Aerospike is uh, an in-memory database. Maybe lay out what, what's happening in databases now, because it's not Oracle world anymore, right? Absolutely. Well, the biggest change in databases, and the reason I founded this company, is that in-memory databases and random access, it's all about going beyond the spinning disks that we've had for so many years. As a technologist, it's been very frustrating when one piece of technology stays, stays static for so long. And rotational disks did that. So all of these algorithms, uh, B plus trees, et cetera, are all focused around removing seeks and using data layout patterns to make your database fast. So we've got 40 years invested in rotational disk and disk optimizations. When it came to looking at flash technology and saying, hey, this is all going to change. Not only do we have RAM, but now, uh, about four or five years ago, we started seeing enterprise flash come available. Yeah. With the Intel X25 being the first big one out there, there were some pregenitors. Uh, then Samsung doing all the great things that they've done recently, Micron out there. Uh, it was clear that we were going to need really ground up a different technology in how we were going to access databases. The best thing about using in-memory databases is you don't have to design ahead of time for the patterns you're using. So this gives developers a huge amount of flexibility to say, hey, let's try something out. Let's be a little more agile about our database use because you're not always working about, hey, let's recreate this index. Hey, let's do a whole new materialized view. You, you don't have to understand as much about databases. Yeah. So all of the power that's coming out of using both RAM and Flash-based systems, it excites me that folks are able to uh, design better applications more quickly. What, what would make you different from um, a graph database like Neo4j or uh, Mongo, which is uh, in the NoSQL uh, database? What, what makes you different than them? So we're, we're all part of the same family. So I'd like folks to go out there and use their NoSQL databases, use the different databases uh, that are the best tools for their jobs. And uh, what we have focused on is the operational issues of keeping a service online. So um, uh, uh, Gartner, for example, uh, when they put out their Magic Quadrant on operational database, listed us as the only visionary in the entire area of NoSQL. And the reason for that is we really believe in uh, having a system that is uh, able to take your front edge database load. So there's a lot of analytic systems out there and uh, graph databases, Neo4j, they're a lot better on the back end looking at the graphs, understanding part of the whole Hadoop movement of doing analytics. But what are you going to do on the front edge? That's where you need something that is operationally very sophisticated, stays up and running. So our folks, uh, a lot of our customers are in the ad business or in real-time marketing or in retail. And they need to have a database that's going to stay up around the clock. And so that's a distributed system, several copies of the data, um, and capable of running at millions of transactions per second, day in and day out. So uh, what does a developer need to know about this new world? Um, and let's stay at a high level before we dig in and, and why, it may, why your system stays up more than others. What do they need to know about this new world of uh, NoSQL databases? And if they're coming from SQL Server or an Oracle box, what do they need to learn? 
So the, the first thing that they need to learn as developers, um, I think a lot of folks have learned, uh, it's a good lesson, which is what Mongo calls the document database, which in database technology terms means stepping away a little bit from joins and using lots of multiple tables, and making sure there's only one copy of your data. A small amount of efficiency, uh, a large amount of efficiency can be gained from small changes in your data model of not having uh, so many different tables and instead using a document style use case, which from a database perspective means more primary key access. And the key to speed in databases has always been to really lean on your primary key access, make sure that that is the, the way that you're getting at most of your data. So if you can figure out where your, your best primary key is, then you know, in Mongo terms you can shard, or even in you know, the old days before that of using yep. sharded MySQL, if you can figure out a, a good shard key for your, most of your access, um, then you can create a system that is really horizontally scalable. Now the second point beyond that is trying to figure out where analytics fits. So you're gonna have a batch-oriented system, you're gonna create a design in the, the modern way where you have several different analytics databases, a lot of MapReduce, and then figure out what context is gonna be important to someone on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. So when I'm walking around, what do people need to know? Uh, if I'm building a restaurant recommendation app, um, when someone gets to this trigger point, uh, what do I need to see? That you're gonna need to push into your front edge database, and a lot of it's gonna have to be accessed with uh, geo indexes and primary key ind indexes, because you can't really uh, expect to do a whole bunch of work on that front edge. Yeah, it's really an interesting world, uh, uh, building new systems. Um, you know, at Rackspace we have, uh, we bought Object Rocket, which makes uh, Mongo fast by running it on, on uh, native boxes, not necessarily on public cloud boxes, although they look like a public cloud box, but they're, they're not running in the virtualization system. Is that sort of where you're going to? Is you want pure access to the, to the hardware and not run in a virtualized uh, instance, or can you run on public cloud? Uh, uh, absolutely, so at Aerospike, we, we look at really first the software problems. And a lot of the uh, benefits that accrue to, when using Flash, um, virtual machine environments don't get as many of them. Uh, you're doing a lot more memory access, RAM access. Virtual memory slows down a lot of those uh, accesses. So uh, what we see at Aerospike is uh, a lot of deployments where uh, there's a hybrid um, uh, bare metal and um, uh, cloud system. So, you want to be able to have some of your databases, which are sort of well provisioned, well understood. Having those on bare metal systems with a lot of flash that are properly provisioned. And then on your front edge, using a lot of virtual machines, right? Because those are stateless. So there's this really important design point uh, in building these new apps where you've got those stateless virtual machines out there and then you have a database. Well, you might start your app using those as virtual machines and using those with, say, an in-memory uh, virtual machine environment. As you grow, at some point you can say, hey, I want to stop paying so much in virtual machine costs and moving over to a bare metal environment. So a lot of our customers really prefer a cloud that is, has a lot of bare metal capabilities as well as having virtual machines. Now our deployments, we also, we first of all, we say, you know, hey look, here's virtual machines in different environments. Uh, we're also working on cloud services. That's obviously the thing to have because uh, as I've been saying, uh, installing software is so 2012. Yeah. Um, I just want to be able to connect to it. Uh, what are you telling me I have to install some software? That's, that's, that's so ancient. Um, the, um, in this new world, I, w to get to millions of transactions, uh, uh, I guess, an hour a day. Second. Um, a second. A second. That's a lot. <laughs> I'm thinking of that's, that. Well, Union Pacific has uh, sensors underneath all the rails, and they're seeing 40 million hits a day. <laughs> but you, if you're a retailer like a Walmart, you need uh, a, a lot more than that. Right? Well, this is, this is part of what you can do, and, and part of our message here, is that if you are building a contextual app, you can go beyond just having one database look up for one profile. Maybe in building one page, I want to have 100, I want to have 200. How can I make it richer for my users? How can I show what my friends have also seen on this page? How can I do real-time recommendations for trending items? All of these things, you can, you can start pushing them from your analytics systems into real time, and that means that, well, maybe you do only have 100 page loads a second, but now if you, you can start thinking about uh, much larger scale databases. So uh, one thing that we've shown uh, as part of our uh, Aerospike product is 
per server a million transactions per second out of RAM, but it's also clustered. So if you need more, hey, just tack that on. Wow. So that's, uh, that's on you know, modest hardware too. That was on you know, last year's Xeon's uh, 6500 uh, 6, series uh, dual hex core. So you know, nothing terribly exotic. Uh, we have customers doing uh, 150 to 200K per second per server on flash. So um, building up uh, systems that can take on the uh, North American real-time bidding database load, which is running currently at about a million bids per second. That's all of the ads, right? All those companies are making contextual decisions about what you should see based on recent behavior, based on your location, based on stocking levels of, of local stores, right? Yeah. All of that stuff does require that kind of load. So for small guys, it can mean building a richer experience. For big guys, it can actually mean just getting your job done. What's the cost like? How do you guys get paid? So uh, we're a software company, and as a software company, uh, we have, first of all, a free tier. So free, classic freemium model and up to a certain size, you can just use it, use it forever, be happy. Um, and then past a certain level, we uh, charge by uh, data size. So once you get up into the larger, more sort of, I hate to use the word enterprise, it means so much to different people. But as you're getting into larger scale deployments with multiple terabytes of data and you're using a lot more servers and a lot more flash, then uh, we charge. Yeah. The speeds sound like they're a lot better than like Mongo or other approaches. Is that true? Yes. So, uh, and we, why, why would that be? Why, why are you guys so much dramatically better in terms of well, um, there's, transactions there's a, per second? Well, there's a simple thing called software engineering. So um, I've been in the Bay Area um, doing uh, high performance software database uh, network design for over 25 years. Um, this isn't my first file system. We had to write a, an entirely new log-based file structure to use direct device access. That's one way that database guys have traditionally uh, found a route to speed. Uh, so we don't simply use memory mapping. We don't pretend like RAM is the same as, um, uh, and we do a lot of multi-threading. Multi-threading is very important for uh, parallel access, which Flash and uh, RAM excels at. So we didn't just say, hey, we're going to do the, take the easy way out and build a little single-threaded database. Uh, we attacked the hard problems of building a really good multi-threaded, multi-core code, and then the distributed systems around that. So uh, it's been a lot of work. The project's been many, many years in the making. My co-founder, uh, Srini Srinivasan, is out of um, uh, University of Wisconsin School of Databases, shared nothing. Uh, we rely a lot on my folks I've met in the last 20 years, some of the best engineers. Uh, it was great sort of getting the band back together to uh, put together some really high performance software. So you know, there's a lot of tricks in implementation to uh, make software move fast. Why would a company still need to go to MySQL or Mongo or some other approach? So um, look, relational databases, you can prove that relational databases will solve any problem you could possibly imagine. So there's a certain uh, joy and uh, flexibility that can be reached when using tools that you already know uh, and your programmers already know and your, your, your co-inventors already know. So getting your stuff up and running fast, you've got to do a quick proof of concept. Those are still done on tools that, that you, you know today. Um, so uh, starting off with the MySQL implementation, hear a lot of that. Uh, people say, uh, well, I got involved with, Mo you know, I, I have a scalable problem. I started with Mongo. Um, you know, that's a, a great uh, initial point. So, you know, it, it is important to stay agile and use tools you know. Um, where do you think this world is going? Because, you know, I, I assume other database companies are going to rewrite their back end for Flash or for SSD. And um, where, do, where do you think this world is going and where are you, where are you planning on taking your company? Uh, so, uh, great question. I think that, first of all, no sequel in four or five years. It, it'll be a dream we've all forgotten, honestly. Um, NoSQL was a tool that was necessary because developments within the SQL programming language kind of stopped, right? Uh, you know, was there a great uh, debugger for SQL? No, not really. And so uh, we all needed a way to get together and say, hey, let's, let's create an alternative to that. On the other hand, there's a lot of benefits to that tool set, huge benefits to SQL, the way our relational uh, uh, relations are expressed in it. So uh, what I see is a, a, a phase where we're, we'll all come back together. We'll come back to a richer tool set, what, then it, one that includes document-oriented interfaces, that also includes a lot of SQL, right? So we're doing a lot of work within SQL at Aerospike, and so are a, a lot of the other NoSQL guys. Uh, but we have to figure out how to keep it fast and not just lard it up with a huge number of interfaces that, that aren't as well used. 
So, uh, so there'll be a period where uh, we'll all come back together and uh, certainly we'll see other offerings by other companies, even the lar large companies. Uh, Oracle certainly said at Open World, you know, we have, hey, we've got all these things, we've got your NoSQL covered, we've got your analytics with Exit, you know, yep. et cetera, et cetera. And um, uh, whether they have the goods or not, I think uh, it, it remains to be seen. Um, but it's, I think it's a great time to be implementing new apps and trying to get uh, a richer experience across the board, both for mobile and for PC-based apps. What mistakes are you seeing developers make as they come in this new world? So uh, a lot of folks just simply don't understand the, the, the levels of scale that they could be at. And so they look at, say, a system like Mongo or that's you know, 5,000, 10,000 transactions per second, and they do their designing around these core design points that really can limit the amount of richness in their applications. And if they realized that it wasn't that hard to put together a much higher level of scale, like you're saying, a million is yeah. a lot, well, if we can do a million on one server and then four operationally makes sense, I mean, what, what does that do to your app? Can I, and can I consider building just a whole different class of apps right from the very beginning? Yeah. If you're trying to build a, a true uh, contextual app, like in my book, uh, we, we say, uh, you know, sensor data is going to be mixed with mobile data, um, is going to be mixed with social data and location data. A fuse together and you're going to have to see a new pattern in that data. How would you approach building a new app that, that sees a new pattern like a Google Now, I guess, kind of thing, right? Well, I think the, the first thing to do is really look carefully at your APIs and think about a um, uh, software as a service style model for all the different data components. Because having rich and carefully designed APIs for each one of these components is really going to be key to making an agile design choice later on and bringing in a new feature. So if those APIs are well separated and you go out to uh, folks who you want data from and start evangelizing them. And like say, factual or something? Like factual, like um, I was mentioning uh, uh, British Airways. Uh, they have this big thing that they put out last week. We're going to make sure there's an API call for you as a mobile developer to figure out uh, what flights might be available. We're not going to make you go through the BA app and or screen scrape it. God, God knows that's not be awful. Um, so I think that uh, data purveyors and providers are getting the message that they're not going to build the world's best app. And we're not this big app fragmentation. Uh, it's it's got to stop at some point. And those guys should be putting out more APIs. E even think about you know the Super Bowl yesterday and second screen applications. Yep. Well, if I'm building a great second screen application, I want to go to the NFL, who my understanding is owns the rights to the statistics. Well, they need to have an API, or you need to be able to break out in your app design if you need to build a, a system that, that gets those stats to then build second screen. Um, you know, a lot of model view controller style uh, design using a lot of uh, software as a service architecture will allow you to build a great app uh, and them to build a service, right? And that's, this is where, uh, with Aerospike, we really believe in, take your data, you know, get a nice front edge on it that can take a lot of load and build that service layer out. And that's, that's gonna get us all a, a richer world of apps because you know, people do own their app. The NFL owns those stats, that's great. Uh, if I'm building a great second screen app, I need access to it. I'm probably willing to pay if my app gets famous. Um, you know, let's, let's all get along. Yeah. How, tell me about your company. How was it funded and how many people work there? You covered a little bit of that. Sure. So uh, Aerospike, we, fund, we founded it, I founded it in uh, 2008. Uh, I was approached by three different companies. One of them was a company called uh, iControl, who's still in business. They do uh, home automation. They were seeing the, the massive influx of sensor data. And they said, Brian, come, come and uh, build, a, uh, bring a, build a group together and, uh, uh, to help ha us handle all of this and build great apps. Um, the same week I was contacted by someone with Netflix that was really early on in the days of uh, them doing uh, new stuff in, in their cloud architecture. And also Danger, do you remember them? Mm -hmm. Great contextual app, right? Way ahead of their time, years early. Um, and then they had that awful flame out. So they contacted me, I think it was two months before that, and said, uh, Brian, we're going to have problems scaling our servers, come in and build a group. And that, that started me thinking. It's like if, if really there are so many companies, it's not just a Google or a Yahoo or an Amazon, but really there's this broad tier of tens of thousands of companies having trouble keeping their service layer up. Yeah. Maybe I can use the, the technology I've developed, the, the history I have in the industry. So uh, we sat down and wrote uh, the core technology uh, within about a year and a half, two years. 
Uh, we then achieved our first customer deployments, paid customer deployments uh, within the advertising industry. We then went for funding. We achieved a $2 million round uh, led by Alsop Louie here in San Francisco, mm -hmm. a nice little firm, can't yep. say enough about them. And uh, Tim Draper also came in on that round. Pretty good name. Strong supporter. Yep. Uh, we then uh, raised a second round about a year later based on very strong uh, sales and deployment figures uh, with NEA as the lead. So uh, we're currently uh, uh, two rounds in, and uh, it's a big business and a big opportunity, so always looking for uh, more fuel for that fire. Um, so uh, still working on that. And uh, right now we're at about 40 people. Uh, in terms of development, we found it's uh, important for us to have a second development site. It allows us to give a plurality of views in, t in, in terms of our, our company and our technology. So we have a development office also in Bangalore. Oh, very cool. Um, we also found that Bangalore was one of the best places on earth right now to um, hire high performance C programmers. So yeah. all those guys that Northern Telecom and IBM and Sybase uh, said, hey, you guys do our C coding for us. There's a lot of really great engineers in the Bangalore area right now who are, are exceptional in terms of high performance C coding. Very cool. Where do we find uh, more information? Probably aerospike.com. Aerospike.com. Yep. Uh, so Aerospike DB is our Twitter handle. Um, Google Plus, we do a fair amount of posting there. Great, cool. Thank you so much for coming in. Great Let's get you. you signed the wall. Absolutely. <laughs>